Today, I would say Gospels, not just the Gospel of the Liturgy, but the Gospel of the Vespers and the Matins. They are all from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 14 and chapter 15. And these are the parts where Jesus started before his cross, right before his cross. He started to reveal to his disciples the mysteries, the deep mysteries, the deep secrets of his salvation. He started to tell them about the Holy Spirit. He started to, them, to tell them that he's leaving, he's going. He's going to be crucified and he's going to ascend to heaven, even though they didn't get most of what, they have said, what, what he has said. But one verse struck me, and this is the one I wanted to, to focus on that. But before getting to this verse, the, the reason why the church is talking about ascension and these passages especially, because the Feast of the Ascension is this Thursday. It's a major feast, and as major as the Resurrection Feast, as major as the Nativity Feast, as major as all the, the, the major feasts of the church. And usually when there is a big event, a big incident, a big feast during the week, usually Sunday before or after or both of them would be about the same event. For example, the Gospel of, of the, the, if the, the Feast of St. John the Baptist, the second day of the New Year, the Coptic New Year, second of Tut. We, the, the, the Gospel might be, might, the, the feast might be in any day during the week. But then the readings of the Sunday before and after are about St. John the Baptist. I mean, just an example why we are reading today the, the readings that are related to the Ascension, although the, the Feast of, of the Ascension is four days from now. And by the way, I hope that we come to the liturgy. If we come seriously to the liturgy, on, on the Nativity Feast, on Christmas, on, on uh, Resurrection Feast, we should come to this liturgy. It's 5 to 7 a.m. I know some of you, it might be difficult for you, but I mean, it's a, it's a major feast. Anyway, so this is the reason why the readings are about the Ascension. But again, I'm going to talk about a question that was posed to our Lord in the, the Gospel of the, the Vespers yesterday. Uh, Jesus said, he was talking to his disciples, and he said, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him, and, and this is the, the, the important part, and manifest myself to him. So, whoever loves me, is the one who keeps my commandment. I will love him. My father will love him. And I will manifest myself to him. And that's a perplexing fact or, or info. It's a perplexing. How can you, you will manifest yourself to that person specially, not to everyone? And this is the question that Judas, not Iscariot, the Bible put it in, in parentheses, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? It's a very legitimate question. How are you going to manifest yourself to only your people, not to the whole world? And and by the way, when we think of that question, is it only for the disciples? Jesus, when he said, I will manifest yourself to that person, when? In the first century? In the first century? Hmm? When? All the time. All the time till the end of the ages. God will manifest you. That's a, that's a promise. That's a promise from God himself, that he will manifest himself to whoever will loves him and whoever uh, keeps his commandments. So then, 
Jesus is, is asked the question, and he is challenged by the question. He should give an answer that is tangible, that can be understood and comprehended by the disciples and whoever will listen to this gospel. So he answered, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone, again, he repeats himself, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. So who is going to be, have this manifestation? One, the one who loves me. And this is the one who will keep my words. And for this person, he will be loved by the Father. And we will come to him and make our home with him. I mean, he went further to say, no, 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 it's not just I'm going to reveal facts to him, make him understand, comprehend. No, I'm going to go further to say that this person will be a temple, will be a house to me. His heart, his mind will be a place for my indwelling, for my rest. And this literally happened when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and upon the church and upon every one of us. But are we really a temple to God? This is the question we need to think of and how we can receive this manifestation. I want to begin by, by few comments from the church fathers on, on this passage. The St. Cyril of Alexandria, he, he mentioned this passage and, and he said, think of any one of you. Do you live in a house that is filthy? That is unclean. I know some of you would say, my room is not, is not very clean, it's not organized. And my mom is always struggling with me to, to uh, order my, my room. However, if any one of those youth went to a retreat and went to a place and the, the bed sheets are not replaced, the, the, there is no clean towels, we would say, why do we come to that place? And if the church keeps taking us to that place, we won't go and come with the church. The church is not respecting us. This is not a clean place to, to sp spend even two or three days, which is true, legitimate. So St. Cyril of Alexandria says, if God promised that he will have a house in the believers, then how can this house be unclean? How the all holy, the pure one, would dwell in a place which is unclean. And definitely the uncleanliness is, here is, is sin. Another, another church father, St. Ambrose of Milan, he talks about this passage and says that what was created in the beginning, in the beginning God created, fill in the blank. In the beginning God created, Fill in the blank. Hmm. Heaven and earth. So the very beginning of the creation is heaven. St. Ambrose goes on to say, no, 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 no. The first creation was a heaven and the last creation was a heaven. What does that mean? He said, doesn't man was the last creation? Yes. And he was a place where God should dwell. And if God is dwelling in his people, then they are a heaven. Then the, the creation started with, a, with a, a, a heaven and ends with a heaven. In the first day there was a creation of a heaven and the last day is a creation of a heaven. I mean, it's fascinating to think of that way that we are the heaven. We are the place where God should dwell. I mean... I'm, I want you to keep this in mind because this will, will, will tell you what, where I want to get to. So we are heaven. We are the house of God which should be clean. We are the, the, the place of the dwelling of God. We are heaven. So Origen, Origen, one of the famous teachers of the church, he was saying God destroys. God consumes. Not us. Consumes sin. When he comes in, 
He can do that, but you should allow him. If you didn't allow him, he cannot consume sin. He cannot consume and destroy sin in you, but you should invite him. You should let him in. Don't push him out. He's knocking on the door. That's a great verse. Usually we, we take this verse as when we, we go to mission trips. I think one of the great lessons we would tell people, take the verse of Jesus is knocking on the door for the people to open for him to come in and have dinner with him. It's a great, but on the other hand, it's a warning. This is a warning to us. Because what does that mean? What does that mean that God is knocking on our doors? Hmm. He is where he is, outside. I hope we didn't leave him outside. He won't be able to consume sin. He won't be able to destroy sin. We want to let him in. The more we, our minds and our hearts are packed with worldly, worldly stuff, the more he's not allowed in. So now we know that, based on what we've just read, that one, that God will manifest himself, based, or two, the person who loves him and who keeps his commandments. And he's gonna be, this person will be an a indwelling place to God. Okay, how can we apply that and how th this relates to us? How this relates to us? A big question and an applicable question. And I think we need to believe in what was just said. I have a problem that we, when we say we, wanna, we have a meeting, we have a retreat, we have any kind of church meeting, we, we would say we need to talk about something. We need to pick a topic. The people would say we need something applicable. We need something tangible. We need something that relates to our life. And again, I always say that's very legitimate. But on, however, when we say we need to read the, the word of God, we say no, no, no. We need something. We need a topic. It's not just to read the Bible, to talk about the Bible. But this is the word of God. And when we ask people, do you understand it? Does that make sense to you? Does that make sense to you? They said, we don't understand it. So why, why aren't we wrestling to understand it? I was reading in the, the, those days the, 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 the writings of some of the church fathers. They called them the apostolic fathers. And in the servants' retreat, we talked about one of them, St. Ignatius of, of Antioch. And we were talking about how he was going to martyrdom. He was taken from Antioch to Rome to be martyred, to be given to the beasts. And he was, he was sending letters to many congregations. And the way he's writing, he's quoting the, the, the Bible. I mean, even though that was the first century, or actually very early second century, 108 AD. And he was saying, I want to be given to the beasts to be given as an offering. I want to be like wheat by which the bread of God will may be made to be offered to God. I mean, the faith that was revealed to us through God's word was lived by people, was lived, and God was very clear, was very manifest to them. Why not to us? Because we... We are looking everywhere. We are, our minds are everywhere. But we need to be focused. Another apostolic father, he know, his name is Clement of Rome, he, he says, let's set our gaze, our eyes, our focus on the blood of Christ who gave himself to us. I mean, this should be transformative. This should be transformative. This is a powerful testimonies of people who lived with God died for him, literally died for him. I was reading something just recent about a Lutheran, a Lutheran theologian and historian. His name is Yaroslav Pelikan. And whoever would be interested in, in reading his story, it's very interesting. I, haven't, I, I, I can refer the art, this article to you if you want. He lived from 1923 
to 2006. He passed away in 2006. He was a Lutheran pastor. And he was working on the church history and the, the, the church fathers. And for 50 years, he was reading and he always felt that our need as Christian, Christianity in general, not Coptic Orthodox, in general, Christians need to go back to the authentic version of Christianity who has been received from Jesus to the apostles, to the apostolic fathers, to the next generations until it came to us. And through his journey, he, he published 30 books. 30 books. He taught in, at University of Chicago. He taught at Yale University. When he passed away, he, he, he was teaching at Yale University. Very prestigious school. And in 1998, he became Orthodox at the age of 75. I mean, it's very fascinating to think of someone who's very knowledgeable, teaching in very prestigious school, University U of C and, and, and uh, Yale. And he is very sincere on what, what Christianity might mean. So when he re returned to the Church Fathers, he decided to become Orthodox at the age of 75. He wasn't converted because he met a nice guy, a nice Orthodox guy. No, no, no. He was in a journey. The guy who wrote the article, the article about him was written in 2010, four years after his, his passing away. And the guy who wrote, he was a friend, a colleague, and a student to him. And he was saying his journey to Orthodoxy took him 50 years almost of studying, of wrestling, that's why I'm telling you, we need to wrestle. We need to believe in that stuff. And we need to see the people who believed in it all over the years, from the first century until... I'm, I'm bringing you two exa examples from St. Ignatius of Antioch, St. Clement of Rome, first century, second century, and Yaroslav Pelikan, uh, the, the 21st century, a guy who died in the 21st century. Very interesting to see people when they go back and they see how Christianity, especially in Orthodoxy, is very authentic. Okay, again, where do we want to get to? We want to we wanna believe in that and do his commandments. And what is his commandments? They can be summed up in one word, in one verse. When Jesus, it was said about him in the Bible that he was preaching. What he was preaching? What did he say? What is the one word that explicitly was said in the Bible that sum up the, 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 the teaching or the preaching of, of Jesus Christ? Hmm. Hmm. Hmm? Love? Repent. It is repent. I mean, definitely he, talks, he talked about love so many times. And he emphasized that very much. And he said, this is a discipleship to me. But I mean, when the Bible explicitly said that Jesus was preaching and saying something to, to the people, he said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. How close it is inside you. It is inside you. So what should we do? We should repent. How can we do that? Keep his commandments. But we are not. What should we do? We should self-examine ourselves. We should examine ourselves. What should we do? We should confess. We're talking, Buna Yohanna, Buna David and myself. We're talking about that. How many people are coming to take communion without confession? For years and years. For different reasons. People are not convinced with the idea of confession. People are not... Um, willing to reveal the, the secrets of their hearts. People, they, um, they are not used to it. They are old people and they haven't been raised up in the church and they are not used to it. We can, we can have a bunch or hundreds of reasons not to confess. But if this is one of the, the, the sacraments of the church that was practiced, that was lived, that's a great tool to say, I want to do my, the commandments. I break some of the commandments or all of them. 
I want to grow. I want to repent. I want to be God's person. The church teach, taught us that we shouldn't take communion if we, we haven't confessed for a period of time. A month, two months, three months. But we come easily. Should we tell the people? I mean, that's, that's part of the discussion we had. Abu Nehanna, Abu David, and myself. Should we tell the people and announce we shouldn't, no one should come to take communion if he didn't confess? Personally, I, I don't feel that I would like to make that announcement. However, where do we, what do, can we do with that rule, that canon of the church? I think that it's not that we're going to tell you, don't take communion if you didn't confess for, uh, for three months. I don't think this is what, what's needed. What's needed really is that we decide to, we want to be the house of God. We want him to come and be in our house. We want to get rid of the unclean stuff, the filthy stuff. We want to be his people. I think it's a great time when we are remembering Jesus ascending to heaven. That our minds, our hearts should be longing for the things in heaven. How much do we long to the things on, the, on earth? Wow. Give me a list. Mortgage. New job. Graduate school. Undergrad. Uh, and, I mean, the list can go, can go on endlessly. Endlessly. But now we need to say, God is ascending to heaven. And our minds, our hearts should be ascending to heaven. We should love him. We should do his commandments. We should show that by repentance. Confession is a great tool to that. And glory be to God forever. Amen.